When I was a little child, one of the things that I realized was the value and blessing of the church. I can remember so vividly uh, as a little child, uh, always anticipating being able to participate, go to church, and while that was not always a possibility uh, as a little one, I can remember vividly uh, moments that stand out, and one of those was as a little toddler, uh, probably about uh, three, three years old or so, but post, post-toddler stage, I, I was at my grandparents' house in, uh, in rural Arkansas, in Crossroads, Arkansas, and I can remember that uh, I got up that morning, it was Sunday morning, and I declared to our family, you know, that, that we're going to church today, and, and uh, there was some hesitancy on the fact that whether we'd be going or not, and so uh, I just took off walking towards church. And the church was probably about a mile away, and uh, I can remember someone stopping and asking me where I was going, and I said, I'm going to church, and they, they uh, made me get in the car and go back home, and uh, when I got back home, it was not a pleasant moment uh, for, for me, uh, but it was a reminder to me as I was thinking about this particular message about the value of the church and loving the church. Uh, and uh, we have, in many ways, got away from that concept uh, in, uh, in our society and our culture as a whole. And yet the truth is the church is what Jesus died for. The church is the foundation that guides our lives and speaks into our hearts and is something that we should live for. If Jesus is willing to die for something, we should be willing to live for something. And so today, we enter our second message out of Psalm 27, and uh, it's a powerful, powerful moment uh, in David's life because one thing David uh, had going for him as a whole was he, he zeroed in with clear focus often on the things that mattered the most to him. And uh, one of those things was the Lord's house, the temple. And uh, today we will find ourselves in Psalm 27, verses 4 through 6. But uh, I want to begin by asking you a question. How would you describe your love for your church? Would you say, you know, that your church is a vital link to everything you're about? Would you say that that church speaks to your heart on a regular basis? Would you say that uh, the Lord's house is a place that you see as a holy uh, sanctuary to gather your heart together and and one of the things I love about this beautiful building that I'm filming in today is a place where we can all come together and allow our hearts to be melted together to accomplish his purpose. And he has done an amazing thing through One Heart Church. And I know there are many other churches and some who are watching this uh, are participants in other churches. And the truth is that we realize that, that churches all over the world uh, make an eternal difference. And so today you think about that and the reality is the focus you have determines your future. Uh, because for David, he had one focus, this one thing he focused in on. And as a result of that, uh, it became the, the very uh, motivation of his heart throughout his lifetime uh, was linked to the temple and even the rebuilding of the temple. All those things uh, were a part of his faith and a part of his journey. So today, I want us to look at, if we could, at, at Psalm 27 and Beginning in verse 4, notice what he says. One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tents sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And we certainly know this. David was a singer, and he wrote songs that we read as psalms that are amazing, that speak to our hearts and lives, and Psalm 27 is certainly one of those. And so you begin to start thinking about loving a church, and what does that really demand of each one of us? Uh, because the truth is that uh, if, there's, if we are to accomplish all that he intends through each one of us, then we have to understand what he demands of us. And I think it demands three things that are very important for us to consider. First of all, it demands commitment. We have to be willing to commit our hearts to accomplishing what he wants to do through us. It's the very essence of why 45 years of my life 
have been dedicated to helping the church move forward. And I'm privileged to be a part of that. And you and I know this, it takes commitment. We have to be willing to do whatever it takes in order uh, to accomplish what he intends. The second thing that, that it demands, and when it comes to the whole concept of loving your church, is that we are willing to understand that it requires preeminent focus. Now, what does that mean? It means that here's what David did. He took all of the things he was contending with and all the issues he had, had been confronted by. And remember, he made it very clear that the Lord is his light and salvation. Whom shall he fear? Now, who's gonna, who is he going to dread if God's at work in him because he has salvation that rested in his heart? And yet, the truth is, when you have a preeminent focus, you, you're able to eliminate everything that distracts you and zero in on what it is he wants to do through you. And listen carefully. It is absolutely essential that you and I understand that we love our church because Jesus died for it. We love our church because it is a place not of perfect people or with perfect plans, but with a perfect God who speaks to the hearts of those who are in pursuit of him. All right. And so that's the second thing it demands. Right? The, the, the focus of your heart, no matter what, preeminently zeroes in on what it is Christ has done for you. And we know that he died for the church. A final thing that it demands, that, that, that absolute love for our church demands for, of every one of us, is that we have to realize Jesus died for the church. We have to, there's a realization of that, because here's what you understand. When you understand that sacrifice, it equips you to be more effective in living day to day, because you realize, I, I'm in church on Sunday, and listen, you live out what happens on Sunday, on Monday and beyond. And what happens is you and I stop and go, wait a minute now. So if Jesus died for the church, that should motivate me to live for him. That should motivate me to live to accomplish his purpose. And that's exactly why this particular psalm has such significance. And my challenge for you is this, is to realize something. That what it is he wants to do in you and what it is he wants to do through you is absolutely defined by God's presence at work in your heart and in your life as you choose to be equipped and motivated and challenged in his church. So let's look at this psalm and let's see if we can't see what it is God has for us. And I just want to uh, note for you uh, three verses that, that I would encourage you to stand out, uh, to, to take a moment to look at later on. I'm going to look at at least one or two of those. But uh, first of all, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it's there where Jesus is talking about the church and he's talking about Peter. And he's making sure he understands that Peter, understand now this whole thing links towards all of us doing what we can uh, to accomplish the establishment of the church, all right? And you know, remember he talked to Peter about uh, his role in helping the church, not, not as the foundation. Of the, the truth is the church is built on the rock of Jesus. Never forget that, all right? So then, then in uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, uh, there is a, there's a very powerful verse there that is important for us to understand as it relates to the church. So look at it with me, if you would. Acts 20, verse 28, listen to what he says. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, I think you can recognize very quickly that, that this admonition that is recorded is to make sure that we keep the church as the central point of reference for us, knowing what Christ has done for us, all right? Then one other verse I want you to, to just make note of. I'm gonna read it very quickly to you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, this is what it says. For you, brethren, become imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endure the same suffering at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. So what does he say here? He says very clearly, be imitators of the churches of God in Christ, all right? So as you start thinking through that, you realize that it is absolutely essential. Obviously, David, uh, David was writing in Psalm 27 prior to the church, uh, you know, his establishment of the church, but here's what we know. He understood there was a place, and in that place, you would seek him out, and as you sought him out, he would hide you in his secret place, and he would guard you against any enemy, and he would protect you. Listen, the way you and I live out our faith is, is directly linked to our understanding of the church because what we see is when we come to the church, it's a refuge for the, from the storms of life. It is a place of hope 
for all of our hearts. It's a place of peace that can rest on each one of us. It's a place where you and I have the privilege and the honor of experiencing what God intends for our hearts and lives. And we get to see so many things that are amazing happen. We get to be blessed by watching people be baptized. We get to be blessed by watching folks become a part of our family. We get to be blessed to pray and intercede for God to miraculously help people who are in need. Today, the church is what you and I need to understand is the entity that God established in order for us to live effective lives. And I think David understood that, and that's why he writes. And so let's look at this text, and let's just see. Verse 4, notice what he says. One thing I've asked from the Lord, one thing that I shall see. The first thing I want you to grab hold of today, and there's three things I want you to see that are essential for your understanding of what the church is all about and what the church can do in each one of our lives, and it's this. There is the challenge to prioritize, to prioritize in our hearts what his heart is all about above all others. You see, what David understood was if he could get, if he could get to the place where he could find the tabernacle and he could find the place where God was at work in his life, he could find the place where he could seek out his heart, uh, and what would happen? He would find peace and confidence no matter how many enemies he was encountering. Because he's already said in the earlier verses that he had encountered lots of different things that, that were challenges to him. But because of his salvation, because of the light, uh, because of what it is that shined inside of his heart, he knew he could make it through that. So when you prioritize his heart above your, uh, yours, it means you start looking at church the way that God intended. So what do we do? You'll notice, you notice as you look at this that he, he, he describes in verse 1 distinctive actions that he would take. All right. Notice, notice if you would, he said he would seek, verse, verse 4, he would seek, he would dwell, he would behold, he would meditate. Seek, dwell, behold, meditate. In other words, he's in pursuit of something, and when he sees it, he's going to be mesmerized by it. And as he's mesmerized, he's going to meditate in it. And as a result of all those things going on inside of him, he is going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, those are the kind of actions you and I need to seek as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. How do you link into what God has for you? You find your place in his church, in his house. And whether you're watching online or whether you are uh, able to be present physically uh, in this building, the reality is you know your place and you are linked to God's purpose. And may God guide you as you do that. Uh, the other side of it is there's some affirmation. So uh, now if you'll notice what happened is he asked, he asked the right question um, and, and he asked the right question in the right place with the right motive. All right. So, you know, he, he gets the place and he understands something that, that you and I need to ask the right question in our own hearts because um, the, his, the affirmation he had was very clear that he was going to be able to experience. He said, I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek. In other words, he asked this question of the Lord and that was the pursuit of his heart and life. You and I should live the same way. All right, so first of all, we prioritize his heart over ours. All right, remember, this is the process that allows us to experience what he, what he intends for our lives and what he intends for each one of our hearts. All right, the second thing that you see uh, is in verse five. And, and notice what happens here. You recognize the beauty of his house and, and, and over every other place uh, that we intend, that we encounter in life, because you recognize the beauty of his house and our place there, all right? So just think for a second. Here you are, you're evaluating where you're at in life and you're understanding that God has something for you and you see your place there. You recognize, you recognize the beauty of his house. I know for me personally, when I walk into church, I always look at all the, all the beauty around from the beautiful land that we sit on to the beautiful sanctuary to the beautiful people. All, all those things, they remind me of how faithful God is. And so today, what you look at in verse 5, notice what he says. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. You see, what David made sure we understood was that the call of commitment must be answered. The call of commitment must be lived out. And because that call, 
drives us towards accomplishing what he intended. And I know for me personally, I live to accomplish his will. I surrender to his purpose. I walk in his peace. His joy rests on my heart. His love directs my steps. I am consumed with an awareness that God at work in and around me is directly linked to his church and what he's about. And so today, as you think about that, that call to commitment, because when you look at verse five there, in the day of trouble, he will conceal me. He will, he will conceal me in the secret place of his tent. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. And so you start thinking through, I have to recognize the beauty of his house. And the reality is our place in that house. The second thing I want you to notice is this, and it's very clear that an active pursuit in our own hearts and lives is the key to success in life. Look at, look at how he describes it here. He says, in the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. In other words, when you're in pursuit of him, he will establish your ways. He will direct your steps. He will affirm, he will affirm what it is he wants to do inside of you. And as a result of that, you'll find yourself in a place where you have a peace that passes understanding because you have prioritized his house, his house and our place in his house. So first of all, we understand that, that, that we have to accept the challenge to prioritize our hearts. Secondly, we have to understand that there's, there's a beauty to his house that places us in it that is absolutely essential. And, and by the way, lots of churches don't, don't, are not blessed to have such an amazing facility like we have. But they gather together in storefronts or in buildings of greater beauty than ours, and they all gather together for the purpose of lifting up the name of Jesus. And that's what we do every single Sunday. Our praise team, all those who are gifted to play instruments, they open up to us the opportunity to experience him in a powerful and beautiful way. A final thing I want you to see today is this. I want you to, I want you to walk out of this message going, yes, I will love my church until I see Jesus face to face. That is the challenge of this entire message. If you would, look at verse 6, because there you see he begins to talk about what happens in that secret place in our lives. Look at verse 6. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent, remember the secret place of his tent, sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And the question I want to ask you before we dive in a couple key thoughts is this. Where's your secret place? Do you have a place where he speaks to your heart, where he grabs hold and motivates you? Do you have a place where he challenges you to be able to experience everything that he has in store for you? That secret place, he says he talks about it being in his tent, a place where he could gather together and heard God speak to his heart. All of us need one of those. And so... You'll notice that he talks about the troubles that, that are around him, the enemies that are around him. And it's interesting, he's always contrasting what he's having to deal with with how he deals with it. All right, the enemies are coming at him. What does he do? He goes to the secret place and he's safe there. He's safe to experience what God intends for his life. And so you and I understand something. Trouble led him to the church, to the, to the secret place. Trouble, he had challenges. And, and listen carefully, you want an answer to every trouble you'll ever face? Find it in his house. Find it in pursuit of him. Find it in the church. A second thing you see is not only did the trouble drive him towards the church, but he knew there was a tent than which he would be built on a rock. That tent built on a rock was there to solidly guide him through every step of his journey, even in his greatest mistakes. He would find himself back to that tent, back to the secret place. And so today, as you think about this, you begin to, to realize something. There's one final key concept that I don't want you to miss. And because when it comes to the church, it's, it is a place that we sing and shout for joy as a way of life. You'll notice what he says here. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, and I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to him. And here's what I want to end with, with these two questions that I hope will help you. And I hope this message has challenged your heart today uh, to love your church even more 
uh, than before you started listening today. First of all, do you have a song in your heart? Do you have something you sing that absolutely grabs hold and guides you to where he wants you to be? Everyone should have a song in their heart. And the truth of the matter is, it's not your capacity to sing. It's your capacity to believe that makes a song so beautiful. A second question I would ask you is this. Will you love what he died for? Because that's what the message is all about. Jesus died for the church, and the church is the entity set apart to accomplish his purpose. The church has been through everything and withstood all that was contending and all that it ever, had ever dealt with. And it's so interesting when I, when I talk to my friends in other countries where they have battled communism and other things, what you discover is every great challenge was answered by a great God who was greater than anything they would ever face. They were hid in the secret place of his tent. You and I can be there as well. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your guidance in our life. Thank you for the blessing of being able to trust you. Thank you for the wisdom to know that you died for the church, the bride of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone who's listening to this, that they would take these 20 minutes and go, you know what? I need to evaluate I need to evaluate what I love, how I respond, what I do, Lord, and I need to ask the Lord to show me how I could do it better. Lord, I pray you would just do that in each one of our hearts and lives. Lord, we love you. We commit to you, and we this one thing we seek, that we may dwell in the beauty in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, let that be our story, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining today. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. Just a minute or two longer than normal because it's hard to preach a short message on the great subject of God's church. And may you love your church. And thank you for being faithful to one heart. And I pray that you would be encouraged as the days unfold. May this be an amazing year for all of us. God bless. Have a great and wonderful week.